Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am. I noted that the title of this session is Evidence Synthesis in Public Health, Challenges and Opportunities. Um, as I'm going first in the session, it might be that I'm more focused on the challenges than the opportunities, but hopefully I've got some opportunities towards the end as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself in a sec, but before I did, I noted that you know my, my, my brief was around describing complex interventions in public health. So I thought I'd start off with a poll, um, a simple poll, which is um, a chance for you to say um, whether or not um, you're able to describe or name a simple intervention in public health. That got me thinking when I was starting pre to prepare this session. So I'll let the poll run and I'll just walk through my introductory slides while it runs, I think, if that's possible. So if we can multitask here. <laughs> Maybe I can't. Oh, yes, I can. Right. OK. So I worked at the Epicentre, uh, which is part of UCL in London for a long time now, um, where I've done systematic reviews, mostly for the Department of Health, Social Care, and um, the organisation formerly known as Public Health England, which um, I think closed last week. Um, what we found during conducting this work is that um, we've addressed questions, uh, we've needed to address questions that go beyond effectiveness. Um, and the other part of my work has been around making the review process more efficient using new technologies. So in terms of my Cochrane roles, I'm a review author on some reviews. As Jane said, I'm co-convener on the qualitative and implementation methods group. Um, I'm co-senior scientific editor on the Cochrane Handbook. And as Jane mentioned, um, um, I helped write the chapter on com complex interventions or intervention complexity. And I was co-lead on the Project Transform, which was around um, supporting Cochrane through new information technologies. And I should acknowledge that a lot of the thinking here, as um, Lisa said, has been going on for many years. Um, I was part of the MAC methodology project with Mark Pettigrew, read lots of papers by many, many fine authors in this field and obviously influenced um, by my the great team at the Epicenter. So I'm gonna stop the poll now, somehow. I don't know if it's sharing or not. It says stop sharing. So maybe you can all see it. So if you can all see it, you'll know that 61% of you can name or describe a simple intervention in public health and 39% of you can't. So that's interesting. I'll come back to that in a bit. Oh, right, I shared the results. I'll share the results. Okay. So what I'm going to focus on um, is around some of the main issues relating to complexity in public health. Um, and these, this, this issue of complexity arises in a number of different areas. It's about the nature of public health interventions, the epistemology, how we know the effects of public health interventions, and also from the limited evidence base that we've got. And then I'm going to move on to the opportunities to start discussing um, what we're able to do. So, before I get on to my first introduction example, I'll just return to the poll just for a moment. Um, with 61% of you able to describe a simple intervention in public health, um, what I'm hopefully going to start to explore here is the challenge, even when we've got a simple intervention, of actually evaluating that intervention uh, without engaging with some of these issues of complexity that I'm going to talk about. So. The example I'm going to just sort of highlight and use throughout this is around face coverings um, in the pandemic, which no doubt we're all very familiar with. Um, on one level, it's a simple intervention. There is a simple barrier, there's a simple mechanism reducing the virus from entering or leaving the mouth and nose area. So there are some studies, lab-based studies, which look at that exact issue about whether or not these different masks and different types of masks are able to prevent particles of different sizes moving between moving through the barriers. So, you know, one, one easy question is, do masks work then in terms of whether or not um, they, they prevent particles from moving one way or the other? Another question, of course, also is, okay, so we know whether or not um, different sizes of particles can move. Does it actually present infection either from one way or, you know, as in somebody giving infection to somebody else or becoming infected themselves? Another question. But when you start to think about the interventions that we've all experienced on face coverings at scale, um, things become a little bit more complicated. We've obviously got the guidance from um, CDC here, 
and their sort of logic model around the operation and how how to implement face covering um, implement interventions. And we've got the guidance at UCL where I work. Um, I've not actually seen this particular wall, but we can see here on various walls at UCL, we've got guidance on using face coverings at all times and moving around the building. And we've got a guidance here on keeping your distance. So actually we have a multi-component intervention here straight off. We've got the face covering should be worn and we've got the keeping the distance. But note that we don't actually have the face coverings being worn. What we have here is a sign on the wall, which says that you should wear your face covering. Then we can think of an even larger scale, and I never thought a couple of years ago I would have a slide like this, the politics of face coverings. When obviously introduced into a complex, complex socio-economic political um, system, the dynamics of actually wearing face coverings have, uh, have almost taken on a life of their own. And uh, wearing a face covering at the moment is almost akin to sort of uh, sort of saying what your political allegiance is, whether you're one of the people who is sort of concerned with public health or whether you're somebody who is almost sort of saying, well, let's forget the science now. And, I you know, we don't believe any of that stuff. So there's there's a real tension now um, in the in the sort of like what, what apparently a simple intervention in terms of actually using these these fairly, fairly simple face coverings. And that particular outcome, I think, was probably unpredicted in the very early days of people saying, well, why don't we, why don't we try face coverings? But that's a really nice example, I think, of how an intervention, apparently simple intervention, actually, when you introduce it into a complex um, political and social context, actually can have unexpected outcomes, completely out of proportion to what you might have expected. So I, when I was thinking about this, 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 this talk originally, um, I started to think, well, okay, so I've got a simple intervention, but actually when I'm thinking about evaluating its impact, there's, there's, there's almost no such thing as a simple intervention because I have to think about all of these complexities when I'm thinking about its outcomes. So in a way, I think it's really important to separate the property of an intervention from complexity. Sometimes, you know, we've talked about complex interventions in terms of being multiple component interventions and that kind of thing. But actually, the intervention, the, 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 the idea of complexity is more a property of the interaction between the intervention itself and what happens when you introduce it to a particular population. So when we're thinking about understanding the impact of a public health intervention, actually we've got complexity that arises from the very type of intervention that we're introducing, the nature of public health interventions, and also the how we know the epistemology of it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break that down a bit. As Alisa said when we were when she was just doing the introduction just now, there are many different types of public health interventions. So heterogeneous evidence base to begin with. We've got different types of intervention, behavior change, legislative change, service provision, etc. Um, interventions that are aimed to change norms, attitudes, and beliefs. There's a lot of different types of intervention that um, exist in public health. And they operate at different levels. You know, we've got individual level interventions all the way through to family, community, and population level interventions. So really quite a lot of heterogeneity there. We've got different ways in which these interventions are delivered. Sometimes a public health intervention is a simple leaflet, it might be a counselling service, provision of vaccines. There's all sorts of different um, modes of delivery of intervention. And as I've mentioned, the multiple components are, you know, are very, very common. You've got multiple signs, you've got emails around face coverings, for example, in the university, you've got leaflets, there's, and you've got legislation at times as well. So there's all sorts of different um, ways in which um, interventions are put together through these different components. But some of the critical things that they have in common is the distance between the intervention itself and the expected health outcome. So in the terms of our face coverings, we might have a poster on the wall, which is supposed to remind people to wear their face coverings. So from the poster on the wall, we've got the necessity to go and get the face covering, to wear it, to wear it correctly, to wear it at the right times. Um, and then all the way through to whether or not 
um, that actually results in reduced infections. So the, from the distance of the poster on the wall through to um, prevalence um, and, and um, infection of um, COVID-19, there's, there's a large, long and varied causal pathway. There's not just one route to, from, in, from intervention to outcome there. Um, and also what we've also got um, in, in these types of intervention is the length of time over which effects are expected. So, you know, this isn't a matter of me having a headache and saying, oh, I'll take some paracetamol and seeing whether or not the headache goes away. Um, you know, the a public health intervention, for example, um, on smoking cessation or something, um, the, there's the matter of, okay, so I might have the intervention of a period of time and reduce and then quit. But then actually, in terms of seeing the health benefits, the duration of that, the, of that outcome has to continue for years into the future. So again, we've got, we've got difficulty there and, and challenge in terms of, of, of the nature of the evaluation that has to be conducted in order to understand whether or not that intervention has worked. And so we've got this concept of complex interventions, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and you know, I've mentioned about this, this um, distinction between a multi-component and a complex intervention. And I think that's the, you know, the, the, the point I was making at the beginning around the interaction between the intervention and the context and the people involved. I think that is where the real complexity starts to arise. There's lots of talk around non-linear effects, whether sort of having a larger and larger dose should necessarily result in more and more um, outcome. Um, what we often see in public health are phase changes that you don't really see very much change in outcomes until you reach a particular point and then suddenly you do see um, behavior or whatever it is shift. Likewise, feedback loops. You know, in, in um, community engagement interventions, we saw this quite a lot in terms of um, positive and negative experiences of that type of intervention feeding back into the next time that someone was in, in, in sort of communicated with or was in touch with people who were involved in, in an intervention. Their previous experience had an awful lot to do with, with, with their, um, their, their future responses. Um, intervention timing, um, very critical in some public health interventions, you know, I mentioned quitting smoking and that kind of thing. You know, one day I might be really, really receptive to a particular message, another day I might not be. And you know, understanding that complexity and modeling it and, and making sense of it makes this a really tough area to start to do um, evaluations in. So as I mentioned, the causal pathways are multiple, they're less well understood, and you know, prediction becomes much more difficult. I might have mentioned now, I think knowing in public health is hard um, and it's not necessarily because you've got a very complicated intervention. It's because the effect of the intervention is generated by the interaction between the intervention and its, on, and its context. And it's not the intervention often that causes the, impact, the outcome, it's actual people's individual and corporate behaviors that produce this outcome. That's why um, knowing in public health is hard and that's what produces this complexity. So what we need to do when we're thinking about understanding what's going on in an app in a, to generate a particular outcome, we need to know a lot about the context. We need to often know more about the context in a way than the actual operation of the intervention itself, which can look remarkably simple. That leads us on to some of the discussions that you've seen in the literature on complex adaptive systems, where if you've got a higher level intervention, actually it might be more useful to think about the dynamics of a system uh, like, like the introduction of face coverings in our, in our social systems recently, um, in order to understand that actually the introduction of that, that sort of imperative to wear mask was a perturbation in that system and the system then adapted both to enhance, but also to minimize the impact of, the, of that particular intervention. And it's important to note that when you're using a sort of a systems perspective like this, it doesn't change what's going on on the ground. It's simply a way of understanding and that's the, the, that can be useful in some situations and less useful in others. So my final area of difficulty, you'll be glad to know I've come to the end of them now, I hope, um, is the challenge of the existing evidence base. There's just very little money in public health, as we all know. Um, Paul Glazier did an analysis last year, less than 1% of the trials at the time were on um, behavioural, environmental, social and systems interventions. Tiny fraction of the um, research going on in COVID-19. So 
you, know, you can see that compared with many other areas, we see very few public health evaluations. So we have just less to operate with, that's point number one. But also, a really important point is we have almost no replication studies. The number of ways in which an intervention, in which intervention studies differ from one another vastly exceeds the number of studies that we've ever got available in a systematic review. We don't get replications of the same intervention on the whole. What we get are sort of variations on a theme. And that means that when we're bringing studies together, that the classical statistical ways that we use usually to investigate heterogeneity essentially don't work. They work up to a point, but they don't work very well at all because of that wide variety of interventions that we might have, or you know, trying to potentially do the same kind of thing, but there are very few replications. They all do things a little bit differently in different populations. So what can we do? Just check the time, great. Um, so I think fundamentally we need to be really clear about the question asked, um, and I've got some slides on that. Um, in terms of what we can do when answering the question is broaden our conceptual and epistemic horizons, and we need to engage in methodological development. We need to recognize that the story isn't finished. We've actually got some more work to do in terms of understanding how we can know what we can know in public health. So clarity about the research question, really critical. I've spent a lot of time working with policymakers and other decision makers on actually refining the question to understand what it is that they're looking for. Do masks work? Essentially an unanswerable question. What, what, does, what does that question even mean? Are we talking about the barrier? Does that barrier actually prevent particles moving? Um, is it around um, requesting people to wear a mask. Okay, so who are you talking about there? In what context? And you know, what are the socio-political um, dimensions that we need to take account of there? Um, and this comes down, of course, to defining the PICO. There's a lovely um, chapter, chapter three in the um, Cochrane Handbook, which is which is about that. Um, we need to be really, really clear about the level at which we're wanting to conduct that synthesis, who it is that we're going to be including, what types of intervention, et cetera. Critical also is actually what type of question is being asked. A lot of the time, um, policymakers, practitioners are actually not looking for something which gives you to the nth decimal place, the size and the precision of a particular effect for a particular intervention, because we all know that when we do a new public health intervention on the whole, people do something slightly different in a slightly different population. So knowing something to the nth decimal place actually isn't all that useful if you're not going to be doing exactly what you're seeing in the research anyway. What people are often much more interested in is explanation and understanding what is going on in intervention. Why was the effects observed in that situation? And especially what is driving differences in outcomes between studies? That's one of the key questions we often get asked Rather than saying, what is the one effect? Why do we see different effects in different contexts? And coming on from that question as to, from, from in terms of why we see different effects, actually why and how does that intervention work? Under what circumstances does it work? What's the relative importance of all these different com multiple component of interventions? Can I dispense with the sign on the wall telling people to mind their distance if they're wearing face masks? Because that might actually be doing much the same thing in terms of just reminding people and keeping in people's mind the need, the need to be careful. Um, what are the mechanisms of action which are at operation, which are operating there, um, and what factors imp impact on implementation, especially face coverings, all the politics and all of that kind of thing, in terms of participant responses. So there are all sorts of questions around effectiveness, but they aren't asking, does it work? They're all talking about feasibility, the dynamics of a system, and, and understanding variation in effect. So the challenge for us in terms of doing evidence synthesis are that the questions, legitimate questions in public health are challenging to answer. They, understand, they want to understand what drives differences in effect, why interventions have an effect, diff, ask about in, impacts at different and hard to evaluate levels. So population level interventions, very difficult to evaluate in an experimental methods. 
some questions can't even be addressed in experimental research impact on of on in terms of socioeconomic um, factors um, in terms of outcome effects and that kind of thing you can't answer those questions in experimental research methods um, and we must recognize that the methods for evidence synthesis have been originally evolved to address more clinical questions where causality was easier to establish using experimental methods and we can see that public health evidence is less amenable to that partly because of the complexity of the, in, the, um, in the type of intervention, and but also due to a much smaller investment in the evidence base. So our key methodological challenge is how do we provide methodologically rigorous evidence synthesis, which addresses these real world questions, given these challenges. So how do we address this challenge? So for a start, those of you who haven't seen them yet, I recommend watching last week's presentations. Essentially, if I could, if I could, you know, being an evidence synthesis, I would say the thing to do is, you know, that the, what they're all saying in their subtext was we need to broaden our horizons. So we've got Ava's presentation, which gives us nine recommendations on, on preparing to do a systematic review in public health. But, you know, broadly speaking, it's making sure that we've got horizons of our perspective set in the right place, making sure that we're really aware of the context of decision making, making sure that we've got the right voices in the room in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, the use of logic models, using theory to understand what's going on in terms of intervention, getting a grips of unintended consequences, particularly important when we're thinking about the political dimension as we've seen in the face masks. Um, and then she's also got considering eligible study designs. So we need to look beyond some of the traditional study designs that um, we've used in Cochrane in the past. Hugh's talking again, broadening horizons, non-randomized studies. There are systematic review questions that require non-randomized evidence to answer, period. And there's a lovely um, presentation and slides around, around that. Kate and Andrew, broadening horizons again, different types of study, qualitative evidence, the contribution that qualitative evidence can bring in terms of understanding um, people's experiences, the appropriateness and acceptability of interventions, but also the effects of interventions on equity and other issues. Ashrita, really interesting in terms of needing to broaden our horizons to understand what is actually been you know the, the the distribution of research activity there's a fascinating work um that's been going on here just showing visually that there's very little evidence in this case of what works in terms of equitable interventions to target children who are socially discriminated against so you know in terms of our investment in research that's not good enough but unless we go looking at the distribution of evidence and the distribution of funding to which drives research we're not going to know this so really important to understand where research is being done and where it's not being done and Carlos, again, broadening horizons using modeling studies. Um, the value of modeling studies is nicely um, summarized in this presentation, addressing questions where there's limited evidence, where RCTs are impossible, and in terms of extrapolating um, meta-analytic and um, systematic review evidence into other populations. And the other um, Metaphor I thought would be useful to re remind ourselves here is Harry, Harry Rutter's dangerous olive of evidence. What we mustn't constrain ourselves to doing is thinking that we can only know what we currently can know in terms of our current methods and the current evidence base. We shouldn't be going to policymakers saying, well, you know, all we can tell you about is uh, this, this, this narrow slice of interventions here, because actually we don't know how to synthesize the rest of the evidence base. We're only going to tell you about this particular little slice of it. So I can see that I'm just about out of time. So I'm just going to wrap up now. So in terms of where this takes us, it takes us in terms of conventional methods to an uncomfortable place. And that's where I thought I would start to leave it now in terms of a, a final poll, because the implication which we often sort of don't say quite as explicitly as this, but I think it's something that we need to really think about is actually how we should be using non-randomized theoretical evidence. Um, evidence from qualitative evidence synthesis, evidence um, from modeling studies, etc. Traditionally, we're told we can only use this for hypothesis generation rather than drawing conclusion in a review, which will then go into practice. So what do you think at the moment? Do you think that we should use this type of evidence for hypothesis generation only, or should we start making causal claims? Hypothesis generation 
only this, you know, going further than that is just too dangerous or making causal claims, um, the view from up here is great. Really interested what you think there. I'll leave that open um, and I'll just go on to my last slide. There we go. The end with a question mark. Consideration of complexity is needed when we're considering the impact of any public health intervention. I hope I've, I've, I've explained why. Also, that it's hard to know in public health because of the type, the nature of public health interventions, epistemological challenges in evaluating them, and the nature of a limited evidence base that we've got available. Also, limitations in our, in our methods for synthesis. Some methods of evidence synthesis are available, but I would argue that we haven't actually got the whole picture yet. So more methodological development is needed. And so it's an interesting place to be in terms of in terms of working because there's opportunity for methodological innovation. And I've got a fantastic poll result here. I'm very tempted just to stop it right now um, because we are split exactly 50-50 on hypothesis generation only and making causal claims. So that's fascinating. Thank you very much for participating in that poll. And thank you, that's the end of my presentation. James, thank you so much. That was fabulous, the way that you linked with the uh, first symposium. And uh, I've learned a new word, perturbation. Um, I'll have to be careful how I pronounce that. But uh, Sarah, um, let's just pick up some um, views and questions from the chat. We've only got a couple of minutes, so um, I'm sure that some questions have come in. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, a few comments, uh, which I'll just briefly summarise. Uh, firstly, uh, a comment um, from Tracy Howard that we can all agree with, that just when you think you know something, you realise how much uh, you don't know. I think that really sums up your presentation very well, James. Also, just a comment from um, Pavel Zelnov, that if, if a, public a public health intervention is multi-PICO by definition, it is, it is complex by definition. And a related question um, from... Um, Andrew Booth, one of our speakers from the first uh, symposium event for you, James, is so is something only complex or simple according to the evaluation lens in which we are using? So in other words, is it in the eye of the beholder or does complexity actually exist? Thanks, Andrew. That's a, <laughs> that's a nice question. Um, I think a lot of what we do in, in research and in, and in knowing in general is apply different lenses to you know, observations. And so where the complexity exists, is it a, is it a real phenomena in that sense? Um, probably not. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a useful heuristic for us to think about. Um, but I mean, there we're gonna get into all sorts of deep philosophy in terms of deterministic or sort of um, stochastic and random um, accounts of causality. So I think I, in, a, in a way, I think it's, it's important to be critical about these concepts and not say that they necessarily refer to something real because um, they, are, they are constructions that we use in order to make sense of what is obviously to us quite a complex and complicated world.